Mustard. Hello. Hello. And I noticed that Mrs. White and Yvette flinched. Then there was a rumble of thunder and a crash of lightning. And to make a long story short, Too late. one by one you all arrived. And then the garden was struck by the cook. And we went into the dining room. And Mrs. Peacock sat here. And Professor Plum sat here. And Mrs. White sat here. And Mr. Green, Miss Scarlet, Colonel Mustard. This chair was vacant. Anyway, we all revealed we'd all received a letter, and you'd had a letter, and you'd had a letter, and you'd had a letter. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. The point is, blackmail. All this came out after dinner in the study. You're right. Oh. Mr. Green stood here, and Mr. Peacock here, and Miss Scarlet here, and Professor Plum here, and Colonel Mustard, and Mrs. White. And oh, 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 I'm drifting now. I'm... Everybody, welcome to Clue Movie Podcast where you take. Blah, 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 blah. Let me do that again. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Clue Movie Podcast where you break down the 1985 cult classic movie Clue, one minute at a time. My name is Bo Brad Gilmore, joined by the General Jeff Smith. Um, Jeffrey, hello, you. Minute yeah, seven. you're channeling your your uh, Tim Curry here by just talking mile a minute. It's not easy, is it? It's not easy, and here's the thing. I you know I did the the uh, the wrestling show last night, so I feel like my my voice. I don't know if you can detect. It's peppered with gravel slightly, um, no. but it, it, it doesn't feel as um, uh, functional. Velvety? velvety? Velvety smooth? Velvety? I don't know. Yeah. As yeah. It's professional pe- broadcaster of this duo. Oh, uh, well, well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Uh, here we are in Houston, Texas. It is 73 degrees and sunny. Um, yeah. No, I don't feel like 100% myself, but it's all good because Tim Curry is on fire. We're picking He's doing the, the heavy lifting for us and for minute 70 in Clue. Where he's picking it up. Now, we, we talked last week um, about in the script, it calls this a comic tour de force um, <laughs> yes. in, in, a, in a section, which, by the way, if you didn't hear that last week, I mean, I don't know why you're listening to 70, but if you it, whatever, definitely go back and, li- and, and listen to that again because. In the script, that's its own separate page. You know, no, um, uh, no scene numbers, no other stage di- or screen direction. It's just one page in the middle of it, and then it yeah. picks back up. Just note to reader: this is going to rock your socks off. <laughs> Proceed. It's almost like they should have stopped the movie and went, "All right, here we go." There Get should ready. have been some fourth oh, wall breaking. Well, I think it's when Tim Curry says very well, I know who did it. And furthermore, I'll tell you how it's all done. The the score, the John Music score kind of like gives you a boom, boom, like here we go. Get ready, get ready. And then yeah. even the score doesn't let let uh, down. The, the, the score is amazing to this. It complements the frantic nature and still without getting like overly silly. It's still, you know, in theme with the murder mystery kind of vibe. So kudos to John Morris and kudos to John Glenn. When I talked to him for the for the documentary, he mentioned how back then when they score movies, you would have an idea of what the score was going to be, like the composer would play it on piano. And but you wouldn't hear it until the recording day. Yeah. Of the session. And then you could kind of give notes on the recording day, but you were there with the full orchestra just for the day. So you couldn't totally scrap everything. You kind of had to really trust your composer and so it's exciting, and a lot of directors would say, that's my favorite day. But those are directors, like Steven Spielberg used to say that, but that's because he was working with John Williams, and he knew after three or four or five movies, John Williams is going to come in and make your movie a million times better just from the score. With This is Jonathan Lynn's first movie, and he's working with John Morris, who had done a lot with, with Mel Brooks and you know scored uh, Young Frankenstein and, and, and all those. So he's definitely got... The skill, but that's got to be, that's a lot to put your movie in somebody's hands when music is so important and have your fingers crossed. And I, I, I like to imagine he was very relieved when he heard the clue music, especially in, in this scene, which in the, on the soundtrack, this is called step by step. Well, I mean, can you think of a, um, a 
better title. Perfect. Step by step, one oh. way or another. That's Fletch, you right? Mention... Well, yeah, that's true, but it's also a song by uh, New Kids on the Block. True. And you're thinking bit by I'm bit. I'm bit by think. bit. Bit by bit. Step by step is New Kids on the Block, which checks out because you did mention you saw in sync recently too. So obviously your affinity for boy bands is is showing. Well and you're I, kind of in a boy band yourself. In some ways. But I I will say I was an in sync guy only because my more sister than Yeah, yeah, yeah. More than Backstreet. Um my sister was early uh, again. My sister is like what six and a half years older than I am, seven years older than I am. So you know, I was kind of in that whatever she's listening to in the she car. Definitely had an influence on your pop culture, which makes sense because you know a lot about the era previous to yours. I'm always very impressed with your knowledge of '80s and early '90s. Well, I'm the, I'm so I'm the youngest oh. of I'm the youngest of four. Oh well, even more, yeah. And so my brother born here. Get this, my brother born in '69. My other brother okay. seventy six. My sister eighty six, okay. and I'm ninety two. Okay. That makes sense. So I'm in the wheelhouse of your second oldest. Yes, brother. That's where I reside. Yeah. So okay. again, I think our Check reference base, like if you look at those decades, kind of the eighties is where everything kind of centers around. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because yeah. sixty nine, seventy six, they're growing up really. I mean, in the 70s, but really in the 80s, you know? Sure. And then my sister born in the 80s, so by the time she's, you know, 9, 10, the movies that are on VHS at that time are probably 80s, early 90s right. things, and then I'm getting the the trickle down from that. Do you find that being the fourth, a lot of your, what you're into is dictated by those who came before you? Maybe, no. Actually, no. Maybe a little bit. But I feel that I kind of had the, I was, you know, a youngest of four, but also I had the only child experience too, from the sense of by the time I was 12, I think, or 11, you know, I was the only one in the house still. Yeah. You know? Best of all worlds. Right. So then I kind of had that only, only child experience-ish. Um. You got to find your own way and decide what stuck. And I and felt what, like, uh, here's the thing too. I felt like my oldest brother is a doctor in California and, um, uh, of, of, of psychotherapy or wait, what, what is, what does professor Plum say? Sci- uh, what does he say? He is a uh, psychological medicine. Yeah. Isn't that what he says? He's a professor of psychological Family medicine. Five. And, um, yeah. And uh, so I felt like with that already, like the oldest achieved that. Yeah. It doesn't matter what I do. Check. Yeah. Parents are happy. Par- boom. I can do whatever, you know? Yeah. Thank you for leading the way <laughs> in that. So now and like. No competition on your end that you felt like you needed to top that. You thought, okay. You're like, it's it makes sense. Last week you talked about how excited you were to see a script of a commercial you're in where you have no lines. Right. And that's that's a very unique, non-competitive kind of in that way. I mean, you can be sure. certainly competitive in other ways, but that's kind of a very secure in yourself, not ego driven, not having to prove yourself kind of mentality. Where, like, I, we've talked before on this podcast, like, what part would you want to play if you were a clue? And I always say the motorist because he kind of shows up, he does his thing, and he's out, and you remember him, and he gets to take a nap for the rest of the movie. We did mention last week, but poor. Bill Henderson and uh, uh, Kelly the cook. Kelly, uh, what's her last name? Shoot. Ho, ho, uh, uh, well, Ho is her character. Name, but, Miss uh, Ho is her character. Yeah. Dang it. I feel, I feel bad. Kelly. I'm gonna say it, though. Kelly. You know so, Kelly. It starts with an N. You know Kelly. I just call her Kelly because. Uh, me too. Uh, we're friends. Kelly Nakahara. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Kelly Nakahara and Nakahara family. Um, they're just kind of lying around there. And uh, Lee Ving as well, just hanging around. You know, I think Lee Ving would have been the one I wanted. Because it's just enough. You play this yeah, it's just yeah. enough. Like, you know, you're there in the first, you know, 15 minutes or whatever it is. You know, you get you get some screen time. You got some lines. You're memorable. Yeah. I mean, Motorist is a great one, but you already chose the Motorist, so I'm trying to think of a good backup. That's fine. You'd and be I, good, Mr. Body, too, because you come in, you have to be like... 
you're have a, a huge presence and huge. for the most part even when he's alive he's just sitting there yeah 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 yeah. not a but lot everybody there. Knows he's there he's got his one kind of big monologue moment um and then he's out you know and he's out and then he comes back and then he's dead again Bill Henderson would be good too. I just wouldn't want to think of. I just wouldn't want to be like that. Um, dumb. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the cop. I knew you were gonna say that. He is. We we have decided that he is not a smart cop. Not a smart cop. Not 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 an indictment on the in the on the individual, but on the, on no, the character. He played. You know, it takes a lot to play. It takes a lot of smarts to play dumb, and he must have been a genius he must- in real life. Um, because he was the dumbest cop. He he popped up in a movie I was watching the other day um, called Hard Lessons. I think it was called. Hard that sounds like a Skinamax movie. Well, <laughs> it, it was a t- made-for-TV movie that was then re-released, I believe, theatrically because Denzel Washington was the star. And this is when uh, he was still a, a TV star at the time. Do you, are okay. you finding it? Also, a, a movie called Hard Ground. Is it not called ta- Hard Lessons? No, I, no, he's, he did a couple hard movies. Uh, hard Ground is with uh, aging Burt Reynolds. That is from 2003, so that's towards the end. Uh, let's see. 1986. 1986. 1986. Okay. It's also, okay, so it was released originally as the George McKenna story and then re-released as Hard Lessons. Oh yes, and IMDb. It is the George McKenna story. The George McKenna okay. story. Okay. Yes. So he popped up in that. Washington. He, he wasn't. He wasn't real great in it. I mean, no, no. He. I'm saying he was good as an actor, but like, I didn't like his. I didn't like his character. He's a little smarmy. Oh, he was a bad guy. Yeah. Yeah, not a bad well, guy, but a little smarmy. That's good too because he's a very likable actor in other things. He's likable in Fletch. He's likable in uh, uh, City Slickers. City Slickers. Clue. So. That's good. That and Clue, of course, he is likable and dumb. Boy, a lot of the people in the uh, George McKenna story do not have photos next to their names. So a lot of people that looks, it looks like one and done. I only recognize the, Denzel Washington oh, and Bill Henderson. Yeah, Richard Richard Masser is in it, and he was in. He was the dad in License to Drive, but he was also in The Thing. He was the dad in Risky Business. He was, uh, he's done some stuff. You know, it was funny when I was watching this movie and then we'll, we'll get back into uh, the minute, but when I was watching the George McKenna story, hard lessons, you know, what stuck out that was just so painfully obvious is, um, Denzel Washington was acting his ass off in this movie. And, like everybody else was like, everybody else was like mid eighties TV movie level. You know I mean? I'm talking about the younger cast mainly. Um, you know, obviously Bill Henderson was great. Um, but even his wife, who uh, the actress who played his wife, felt like okay, like she's given her her all, but it's it, it's le- no disrespect, but it was just levels below every uh, Denzel Washington. Right. Like Denzel Washington was so high above everybody in this yeah. movie, and I'm sure there was somebody watching this in '86 going, "This guy, that guy, <laughs> this guy is great." All those other people are not going to have photos on IMDb, and this guy is going to win an academy award uh, he was sensational in this movie and i mean it's, the movie's like not really like a great film or anything like that it's a tv movie from the 80s but it's for denzel completists this came out a year after clue by the way so this is bill How henderson you end up watching it what what platform were you on that it, it crossed po- your it popped eyeballs. up on netflix i was trying to find something okay. to watch and it was, came up suggested on Netflix, and I said, "What is what? What Denzel Washington in the eighties? What is this? I've never heard of this movie. Hard lessons. What do you think you had been watching previously that Netflix decided to suggest such a? And you watched it, and I did watch it. Yeah, I did. So you do you take Netflix suggestions seriously? Never. I'm actually not a Netflix guy, to be honest with you. I don't watch Netflix a lot. There's not much <laughs> on there. I like my friend Kyle Hubbard. Shout out to Kyle. Yeah. Always says Netflix is the ultimate database of movies and TV shows I want to watch, just not right now. And um, <laughs> and 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 That's so I, I actually venture away from Netflix. I find myself more in like the the prime video, 
uh, Hulu, you know, areas, yeah. Peacock. Do you find you go to Netflix always hopeful yes. and then leave often disappointed? Yeah, I, I do. Too. Like, I don't, I still have it. I don't get rid of it because I think there's a chance because it's the OG. So you think, okay, I should always have Netflix. Yeah. But I agree. I don't know why I have Netflix. Who knows? You know, but like for me now, you know, Mike Tyson and Jake Paul are going to be fighting in the summer. I got to watch that on Netflix. And then okay. WWE. There's always something that makes you stick around. Like, uh, I'll, I'll keep it. Well, you know, Netflix bought the rights to WWE Monday Night Raw. So it's going to be live oh, on Netflix. Definitely, you definitely have to keep so it. You got to keep it now. Um, now, the, the other thing I liked about this where every time that the Game Piece characters had the same idea of what to say. Too late. Oh, yeah. Or get on with too it. Too late. Or get on with it. Yeah. yeah. Those are great. That's true. Love that. And then, if you noticed, two things. When he gets into the dining room, there's a cut that, to me, is like a pretty obvious cut where it goes okay. from a wide shot to a close-up of him. And I don't know uh-huh. if that's because he was having trouble like keeping his breath throughout the scene or... Where he says, anyway. Yes. it's a, Yeah, that's an odd... Pause. It's almost like when uh, an open mic comedian doesn't know what he's going to say next, and he goes, "So what else is going on?" <laughs> it's this weird, like, reset kind of uh, thing. Not that I'm speaking from experience, but it's that same kind of. Anyway, what was I saying? Uh, <laughs> yeah, we were all having dinner, and uh, yeah, I, it's a. I guess maybe even for the audience, we're taking a, a break because he does tell us where everybody sat. And for some reason, somebody moved Professor Plum's chair off to the side. I guess in the in the reset of the uh, dining room, they decided this chair after dinner. Be at the table. Oh yeah, what is that about? I didn't notice yeah. that. What is that it's about? The only one that's not at the, at the table anymore. Professor Plum gets moved what's, back. What's the theory there? Maybe it needs to be deep cleaned because Professor Plum is dirty. Does he? Uh, I do like. Jump also up that Mr. Say? Green. No, go ahead. Uh, does he spill? I don't think so. No, it, the spilling happens on the other side because Mr. Green. Yeah. Knocks huh. his spoon on. Odd. That it's I think a, that's a mistake. It's like the shining. The, the furniture just moves. So over to the shining. I like the Mr. Green because it's going with our theory, which hopefully there's not a clue listening that goes, "Yeah, we all knew this." I like our theory that. Mr. Green is always FBI and is not the real Mr. Green because right now, whenever he decides to make a, a smart declaration, the glasses come off because I don't think he needs them because they do come off at the end of his of his uh, last ending. He takes the glasses off to say, all this came out when we went to the study. And then that leads to the next scene and the glasses come back on. His disguise, if you will. It's like now, Clark Kent. It is very Clark Kenty. Now, I will say... You know, I'm going to do this for effect. So, like, if you have glasses uh-huh. on and then you want to say something and you go, but. Yeah. It is a it is a great move. You know what I mean? So, Brad just put on his glasses. On? What he said, but they came off dramatically. But. He's doing it again. Oh, that one is a little awkward. He hit the yeah, microphone. Yeah, hit the mic and it was hanging Try out. Try again. Take three. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a hat. It's not the easiest with a it's hat. True. You know, here. Okay, so, but. This is visual. Oh, that was a good one. Man. All this came out in the study. Um, yeah. So it, it is a good it is a good visual thing. The other thing I wanted to say about them in the dining room, Wadsworth is still blocking where the cook would have been. Well, we all knew he did that from the from the first day we ever saw that movie. Did you? But did that you pick up on that? that yeah, of course. How dare you? Uh, I also do like not to push past this. It, so much of this is in really wide shots where you get to see everybody so this is one of those parts where it does feel like a play other than where it cuts into the close-up that you mentioned where it's like we go into another take and perhaps it's what it was it was okay this is i need a second give me a second to catch my breath here that's no that's what that is you know when when Uh, you're recording music and like you're doing a, a vocal track and you're starting to run out of breath um yeah they do a thing it's called a punch in Right, I'm sure you're familiar with this doing VOs or what have you for documentaries punch, or whatever. Yeah. Is um, you punch in, okay, cool, and I'll pick it up from that. 
And um, beep, 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 beep. yeah, boom. And um, throw the one. yeah, Girl. yeah, or yeah, or yeah, or yeah, when you ADR, right? It's just similar in 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 some ways. Sure. But a punch in is like, okay, I'm going to pick it right up from there. And that's what this felt like. Okay, boom. Let me punch in from that. I can't. Yeah. The breath is out. I can't do this, like, c- continuously for the rest of this take. Give me a moment to reset. To me, that was an on-set decision. Okay. I think that was during shooting. There, he, I think, And I think it's a Tim Curry call. We're taking a pause. Just a very brief. Anyway. And now we resume. Yeah. Could very well be. What it, it's what it feels like, man. It's what, what it feels like. Listeners. And then, um, you know, he runs out of the dining room, of course, back into the hall, and then into yeah. the study is what we, that's the study? Yeah. So much running. And when I talked to Colin Camp, I, I did talk to her about this. I said, you guys run a lot. And she had mentioned that the set is not as big as it seems Mm. so that there's a lot of running in the same spot maybe only taking four or five steps but it's definitely stretched out for the movie but they're always nobody from this point on nobody just kind of saunters into a room no one just kind of walks in casually it's it's a huge run and and they, they have to even like put the brakes on like cartoon characters where they kind of the momentum pushes them forward a little bit. They don't they yeah. even stop properly. They're moving so fast. Yeah. And, and, and it's kind of interesting because you know how sometimes in like seventies and eighties movies, when there's like a fight scene, you could definitely tell it was done slower and then they sped it up. Oh, uh, undercranked. Well, that's what, is that what undercranked means? Undercranked is, is uh, what it means. That's how they would go into slow motion. So you're shooting more, or less frames than so you could uh, speed it up. 24. Right. So then it's faster. It'd be like when they shoot more over cranking puts it in slow motion. So when he puts in the script, it's under it feels like it's gonna be under cranked. That'd be like when you see silent movies like Charlie Chaplin or Buster Keaton, and everybody seems to be moving really fast. It's because mm-hmm. it's under cranked. I did not know the, that's what that I meant. For. Oh, okay. That's what he means. Yeah. But it doesn't, so. but it but it isn't under cranked and it doesn't feel under cranked to me. No, because you could tell. Even if you see that in car chases every now and then, where mm-hmm. you could tell, eh, they're not going that fast. Right. It's why in the the uh, Blues Brothers, and also uh, what's the f- French Connection? They put pedestrians on the street so you could see them walking, so you could tell that it's not sped up later it's that they were driving that fast. Oh, interesting. Tim Curry is like a car chase right now. He's that fast. He is. I mean, I don't know. What do you think, like, if you had to prep for this scene? We'll end it here. If you had to prep I for the scene, what does your pre-shoot routine need to be in order to execute that? Oh, yeah. for me, it would just be hire the right actor. No, I'm talking about if yeah. you were Tim Curry. If I had to be the actor? Oh, yeah. I couldn't do it. I, I have trouble. Listen, I stumble over my words just here. I would add an uh between everything. He'd have to cut out. I would look like a, a YouTube vlogger where you could tell that they, they, they're they so choppy. Like nothing is so distracting that when you see them and there's like there's an odd jump cut in the middle. Like what did you cut out? Like where, what tangent did you go off on? We're like we're here to talk cut about the true cut, life murder cut. What? what yeah, do we, I don't get what, what this is. I don't care why they yeah, do that. It's, a, it's an odd style. Get in one. If you Get in really, one take. I think we've we've seen it enough that we don't notice it. But if you ever pause and, and decide, I'm going to count how many jump cuts are in this YouTube vlog entry, especially in true crime things, you'll be suddenly very distracted. And Tim Curry does not need jump cuts. And so much of the shots, that's why I think that, that close-up that you're talking about is jarring because it is all done in one. And you can tell that there are no edits. So when there is one, it takes you out for a second because it almost feels like cheating that he doesn't need. Right. But you have to also wonder, because you did mention quick shoot, they couldn't be there all night. And eventually somebody just, not only just the, the performance, but just the memorization, just when he's talking about where everybody was sitting is impressive that he gets their names right. He says where they're sitting. He's, so he's doing the physical part, running around the, the room and pointing to the couch, pointing to the chair, getting their names right, saying it clearly. 
and then moving on to the next. It's, uh, and then remembers not, not, remembers the slurps. It. Yeah, how could you forget the slurps? Two were slurping. Yeah. yeah, the way they're sitting. So it's 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 a tour de force. I need a few cans of Red Bull to get me through that one, man. Yeah, three Red Bull. See, this is the '80s, so I don't think he was well, they, doing what they, would do. But they had a version yeah, of Red Bull know. back then. <laughs> A little, yeah, they had, it was called booger sugar, yeah. But it, uh, some of that a, Betty White, brother. Hey, I you know we got to do a big scene all night long. Yeah, I don't know why Johnny Carson showed up. Oh, uh, yo, I had a couple of uh of howling monkeys at the squirrel hut last night. I see uh, Johnny Carson over here earlier, Jeff. Uh, yo, Johnny, uh, yo, uh, here we go. Um, well, Jeff, look, that's minute seventy. That's minute seventy. Yeah. And I yeah, think I think it's time to wrap it up. All right, man. All right, you good with that? <laughs> yeah, I'm good with that. Yeah, I guess. Sure. Everybody okay with that? Can we wrap it up for now? Well, we, we'll, we'll be back on this edition. Our next edition of Hard Lessons Minute, we're gonna look at the George McKenna oh, story yeah. a little that's, bit closer. That's our next podcast. Our special guest <laughs> will be. Hold on, not Denzel Washington. We got. We'll get. We'll find our way to that. Our special guest will be. Michael C. Matthews, who played EJ. EJ, yes. How could I, look? Come on. EJ. He was also in Shocker, the Wes Craven movie, where the guy goes to the electric chair and does not die. Oh, you're not talking about his um, great performance as uh, Dan Clark in The Littlest Hobo? I don't think I need to mention that part because we all know it. But I'll tell you some some trivia about Michael C. Matthews. Give it to me. While waiting on his big break, he did impersonations of James Brown, Sammy Davis Jr., and Michael Jackson in videos and lip sync contests. In 1985, he took first place on the hit television show Putting on the Hits, where he portrayed Michael Jackson in a skit from the film The Wiz. Oh, man. Put on the hits. I used to watch it. It was a lip sync show. It was great. Fortune be found in it. Michael C. Madden, man. Michael C. Madden. Well, this has been Clue the Movie Podcast, Minute 70. And we'll be back yeah. next week with Minute 71. Jeff Smith, ClueDoc.com, yeah. BoatRedGilmore.com. Yeah. And uh, I hate the boat. I love the boat. We'll see you then. <laughs>